in 2021. And as you just heard, it's being recorded. We are meeting virtually uh, in accordance with Governor Inslee's Proclamation 20-28. And uh, Rachel, will you please take the roll? Here I am, I'm just walking closer to the microphone. Council Member Kim Daughtry. I am present, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Joe Marine. Present and accounted for. Thank you. Council Member Jared Mead. Here. Oh, thank you, Council Member Mead. Council Member Tom Merrill. I'm here. Thank you. Mayor John Nearing. Here, thank you. Thank you. Labor Representative Lance Norton. Here, Rachel, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sid Roberts. Here. Thank you. Council Member Jan Schwedy. Here. Thank you. Mayor Nicholas Smith. Here. Thank you. And Council Member Stephanie Wright is excused. Chair, we do have a quorum. I'll quickly take roll call for alternates. Uh, Council Member Gallagher. Council Member Johnson. Mayor Matsumoto Wright. Council Member McNeil, uh, Council Member Nearing. Mr. Chair, that concludes roll. Thank you, Rachel. All right, next on our agenda is public comment. We do have one written comment that was sent to us earlier. I hope everybody got that and read it. Um, it was a long one, but I think it was heartfelt and necessary. Also, uh, Sherry Longnecker Daly has uh, signed up to speak. And so I would like to bring her in. I see she's here. Let her have her public comment. Can you hear me? Jerry, you have the floor. Thank you, sorry, I'm new to this Zoom thing. That's okay, so are we. <laughs> so thank you for listening to me today. Um, I have been with Community Transit since March of 2008. In this time, I have heard so much talk of our mental health and mental and physical health. We have done an amazing job on the phys physical health aspect. What I wanna talk today about is mental health. So many town halls and team meetings and we have yet to implement any true support system for this. We have an EPA and this, that is truly our only source of help. When are we going to implement change? A few years back, I relieved a coach operator who drove one route to attempt suicide on a coach at a layover. In the last month, I reached out to an operator because I read between the lines and took notice of potential self-harm harmful situation. The person reached out for help and is doing okay. Just over a month ago, we lost an amazing woman to suicide. In 2010, 2011, I battled with potential self-harm while working here. Has, uh, has not been an issue for me in many years. The more I talk to operators about this huge problem, I am learning of many more who at some point have had these dark spots. The one common denominator is, sorry, I'm nervous. The one common denominator in this is home and work stress being so great, they just don't know what to do. The one thing we can do for home stress is offer empathetic support. The work stress, we can help by making change. The biggest emotional stress for coach operators is fatigue. These 13 to 15 hour split combos are just too much. We must do better. I do understand the need for combos and I'm aware the FTA allows a 15 hour workday. These 15 hour workdays were intended for over the road operators and the ability to cover miles, not for someone who has a family and does this five days a week for months at a time. This employee has no ability to have a family life except for one day a week. Their work days are spent here, commuting to and from here, bed and back to here, one day off to recover and one day for family. While there is a need for these combos, I suggest a no more no more of a 10 to 12 hour spread for first sign on to last sign off. Offer a 410 work week, more straights, 
and more part-time positions. While I understand the past year and a half has been a difficult one, now is the time to make these changes since we are going to be adding service back into our transit system, offering more part-time positions and allowing operators to move from full-time to part-time to handle family stresses as needed, maintaining their full-time seniority and the ability to move back as space allows. Another huge stress is operation meetings, how operation meetings are handled. This is probably the biggest stressor here. Why must there be three meetings to investigate and administer possible discipline? Why must meeting notices be given prior to an operator going out and drive our coaches? Though my biggest question to you today is, whoever would think it's okay to have any type of pre-termination meeting and expect an operator to go out on the road? This should be unbecoming behavior of a community transit employee as in the policy and procedures of our SOP. Above all, especially the potential termination meeting, is putting safety to the wayside on the road. Community transit's motto, safety service schedule. How in the world would a manager find this safe? How are we supposed to keep our head in the game of driving if all we're doing is thinking about what discipline we're going to encounter, all while dealing with everyday problems of carrying passengers, which you are all aware is a whole new world in the last year. My suggestion to these three meetings with management Management should do all investigator work prior to notifying the operator, one single meeting to discuss the issue, present what was found and either administer or not administer discipline. Done deal, the operator can move on, do better and be in a safer, safer frame of mind while out on the road. We need to stop this insane intimidation and causing a stressful workplace. Dragging this out is not only allowing the operator to be on the road, keeping their, not keeping their, excuse me, Dragging this out is not allowing the operator to be on the road, keeping their head in the game of driving. What it is doing is allowing the operator to make another mistake to have an additional meeting. I know this because it's how I ended up with 21 meetings many years ago, in a year, many years ago. At the same time of dealing with domestic violent divorce, becoming a single parent and losing both parents within three weeks of each other due to an illness. I should have not been on the road many, time, many times during this. I was not safe to be out there. I had zero PTO for I had used it in other situations. My FMLA was exhausting hours, which generates more meetings. This is a huge dilemma for many here. My story is not much different than others. I am just willing to come before you today to share it because I am determined to not have any more town halls or team meetings to talk about change and supporting our employees with the stresses of the workplace. Lastly, support on the road. This was Rhonda's number one complaint. She felt in fear of her life while driving Swift and completely un unsupported out there. Now, while I have been told transportation managers are out on this route, where are they on local routes? Sure, we have road supervisors, but there is only so much they can do before they have meetings with management. Then we think, well, we have transit deputies. Sure, I do not seem to work here either. Often I see them patrolling park and rides. Yet if I wave, I get nothing in return. A fellow union brother and sister who is working for you, not supporting me, true disconnect in my opinion. I had this amazing paper written for you and had to condense it because it was just too much to share with you here. I fear, I feared not being heard throughout. I have emailed this to Rachel, the meeting admin assistant, to share with all of you. Please take the time to read it and supplement to this. Enough is enough. We have all been talking about all these things for years. Now we lost an employee in part of work stress. How many more incidences or suicides are we going to have to have? When is this going to stop? When, is, when are we going to stop talking about change and actually make change? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sherry. We appreciate you. Okay, so now I'm going to open it up to anybody else that wants to do public comment. We do have one hand raised, and that would be Joe Kunzler. Joe Kunzler, you have, Mr. Kunzler, you have the floor. Thank you. You have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I won't need the full three minutes. I'm very busy today, but as you may see behind me, I decided to pick this graphic of a shock test on the USS. Hmm, probably shouldn't use that name in this conversation, but uh, you know, it's, it's a very nice little, little, little ship and uh, it's a stress test because I wanted to make sure we have the remote meetings working. 
And I'm very grateful for that. And I want to leave the, my comments at that because I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. And, you know, I would love to attend CT meetings in person again, but I'm the kind of person that likes to run up and say hi to people, drop off intelligence, drop off presence, and all that stuff deemed inappropriate. So probably should be doing this from home. But uh, I also can't help but respond to what Sherry is saying. And I want to say as a disabled person who a bad left eye and a bad back directly through CEO Rick and the board to the transit operators that uh, your service is very much appreciated by me. Uh, I do want to apologize to a transit operator who I didn't hear two or three times step back and use the back door a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's on me. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine what you operators are going through driving because this is somebody who's a nun driver due to disability. And I really, I, I trust CEO Rick to make mental health a top priority. I, I, I know he's a good man. I know he's been through a lot. Um, I know just the last month itself has been a shock test for a, a lot of people in headquarters. And, uh, you know, the fact with the past year and a half, it's just been one shock test after another, as you can see from my graphic behind me. But uh, one, one last thing to try to get some positivity out of this public comment I didn't plan on giving is that, uh, Yes, it does get better. Yes, things do do get better from the black point. Um, nobody, you know, if a year and a half ago somebody told me we'd have remote meetings, um, I'd say, oh, that'll be today. It's here. It's here now. It's here because greatest people stood up and, and it will get better for our transit operators because I have confidence in CEO Rick to listen and get this fixed and try to juggle that. And the ETCT merger we need to focus on too after operator safety, that's priority number one. Um, and, and just taking care of everybody. And that's my main concern. And finally, to board member Lance Norton, you're my favorite board member, and I'm sure you'll have a great response to a public comment. So thanks for all you guys do every day. And thank you for, again for the remote meetings. Thank you, Mr. Kunzler. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak? Please raise your virtual hand. I don't see any. So I will close the public comment portion of the board meeting. That would bring us to uh, presentations. I believe we have no presentations today. So we will go to the chief, exec chief executive officer's report. CEO Ringo Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The chief exhaustion officer will, uh, will now give his report. Um, I, in all seriousness though, I wanna thank our employee for stepping up courageously. Uh, and delivering those comments about mental health. Um, we do say a lot of really good words in this organization about our commitment to supporting our employees. And uh, we can never rest on our laurels in that regard. Uh, it's incumbent on all of us to operate on a principle of continuous improvement. So we will pay close attention to what's been said here today and uh, use our resources uh, accordingly to make sure that we're addressing these issues uh, and getting better at it. So thank you again for that. So moving on to my report, um, spend the first couple of minutes here just uh, touching on some external activities and, and developments. Um, I've been continuing to maintain uh, my efforts to engage externally with partners and uh, colleagues and uh, important uh, institutions within the region. Uh, the last couple of weeks, I've been meeting with uh, folks from our Snohomish County Aerospace um, community, uh, the head of the airport uh, and the executives uh, lead and your former colleague uh, for aviation development within the county. Um, and it's been interesting and, and rewarding to learn about areas we may be able to work on together and our shared interest in transportation. Um, I uh, have been continuing to maintain monthly meetings uh, with EASC, uh, new CEO Gary Clark, uh, as well as uh, my peers amongst other transit agencies, um, particularly Kimberly Farley at, at Sound Transit and Terry White at King County Metro. Um, I presented uh, to Skit just last week on our uh, plans for returning employees to base and had an opportunity to compare notes with other employers in the county about that. I'm sure that's an issue that all of you uh, are working through in your host jurisdictions. Um, 
but that was well received and we had some good discussion about it. Uh, Congressman Larson uh, was there at the skid meeting and briefed the group on activities in DC, uh, the American Rescue Plan, uh, sort of handicap where things may or may not be headed on the infrastructure package and the surface transportation reauthorization. Um, and so that was a good catch up. It's clear something's going to happen. It's not real clear when. Um, but uh, we'll be engaged, I think, over the course of the summer and perhaps into the fall, um, watching closely where the Congress lands on infrastructure. Um, the Washington State Transit Association quarterly board meeting is ongoing as we speak. I just spent the last couple hours there. Uh, with my peers and that meeting continues on into the next hour. Uh, we got reports on session uh, that just ended. We got a report from WISTA's DC consultant uh, as well on, uh, on national happenings. Uh, Governor Inslee's transportation policy advisor, Debbie Driver, uh, and his director of external affairs uh, are presenting perhaps as we speak on the governor's plans uh, with respect to moving toward phase four and what that means for transit, at least in terms of the state's uh, prerogatives and jurisdiction. So we may have some breaking news here in the next day or two about that. Um, we've all as an industry been following very closely um, the, the LNI requirements, uh, the public health guidance as it pertains to social distancing on board vehicles. Uh, so that's, that's uh, we've got staff in the meeting uh, listening and, and hopefully we'll have uh, some, some new information to report shortly on that. Um, shifting gears slightly to FTA, uh, I think you'll all recall uh, back in April, the Biden administration announced the, the grant of 37 million to CT to develop the Swift Orange Line. Uh, and that was really great news, but it was also a little bit out front of the regulatory process. Um, we learned just last Friday uh, that Secretary Buttigieg transmitted to Congress the annual capital improvement grant report, sometimes called the New Starch Report, to Congress. And in that report, uh, our Orange Line project is officially recorded uh, and was rated uh, as a medium high on cost effectiveness uh, for a competitive application for, for a new starts grant or a small starts grant. So the regulatory process has caught up with the public announcement that we are identified to receive that grant for SWIFT. Uh, so we are aligned with respect to our process uh, requirements there. Uh, it's great news, uh, obviously, for the organization and for the county. Uh, it, 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 uh, sort of affirms our ability to move forward in delivering the project. Uh, and it's a great reflection on the work uh, of our team internally and, and how much hard work they've had to do to navigate uh, the, the twists and turns of, of the federal regulatory process. Uh, so I want to acknowledge the staff that, that has done that work. Uh, Melissa Colley, uh, Christopher Silvera, June Duvall, uh, with the capable and steady leadership, of course, of Roland Behe and, and a number of other people um, that have gotten us positioned to be able to go forward. Uh, it's also a reflection as well, uh, and we've talked about this before, and the confidence that Linda Gerke and her staff at Region 10 of FTA have in community transit and the, and the work we do. So uh, we are excited about that news and uh, happy for the effort that it took to get there and looking forward to, to, to implementing that project. And you'll hear more about that later in today's meeting. Um, also on the legislative front, um, it's been very busy this spring with our senators and our, our elected house representatives uh, members. They've been busily uh, planning for their engagement in the legislative process, and that has included uh, soliciting requests for member directed spending, sometimes called earmarks. Um, we have submitted the gold line, uh, our next BRT project beyond the orange line to both Senator Murray and Cantwell's offices. Uh, Council member Schwedy and Mayor Nehring uh, gave us letters of support 
from Arlington and Marysville for those requests. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll see you later in the year how that goes, but we, uh, we are optimistic and have our fingers crossed. Uh, we've also submitted the ride store at Linwood uh, to Representative Del Bene, um, and uh, who's on the jurisdiction or the authorizing committee in the house and uh, Mayor Smith uh, provided a letter of support for that project. Um, this project qualified and is officially now being advanced uh, in, the, in the house process by Representative Del Benny as one of her top priorities. So that's great news. Um, in this same area, um, I chatted with the executive committee about this a couple weeks ago, but I am gonna uh, bring on some additional consultant support uh, in DC uh, to have some boots on the ground back there as this year is unfolding. It seems pretty clear that the Congress is gonna make some kind of additional investment in infrastructure, and that's likely to, to include a pretty substantial set of funding and incentives uh, for fleet transition, uh, and particularly a focus on zero emission vehicles. So as we do our work to analyze that technology and figure out how to fit it in with the business we're providing and the service we're providing, I think it's gonna be very important for us to, to pay close attention and engage in, in how that policy is being shaped back in DC so that we can position uh, accordingly uh, to, to make a smooth transition. Uh, the technology is still evolving. The cost of entry is still quite high uh, for any transit agency to be able to go into this technology uh, aggressively is gonna require a, a robust federal funding partnership. Uh, so. Um, so we're going to invest a little bit in making sure that we're, we're positioned accordingly. Um, shifting gears to internal matters. Um, we are moving ahead with today on today's agenda with our 2021 mid-year budget amendment. Um, so obviously we'll have a little more discussion of that later in the program. We are also uh, starting work on our update of our six year transit development plan. Uh, we have an internal draft uh, currently being finalized by Roland's group and we'll be moving that forward uh, to the board and next month for uh, review and public comment, uh, which is always so important as we start to shift gears uh, out of a pandemic mindset into thinking ahead uh, about how our network can grow and change. Likewise, we're getting ready to kick off our 2022 budget development process internally. So you'll start to hear more about that. Uh, and it's really a, a great opportunity for us to uh, look at uh, where we are, follow up on the conversation we had at the workshop uh, a month and a half ago and, and, and look ahead to, to the opportunities um, post COVID. Um, Speaking of which, um, you're all aware that we initiated a COVID vaccine incentive program a couple weeks back, and I'm happy to report that we hit our first milestone. Uh, you'll recall that we are offering a, a financial incentive to employees uh, if we're able to achieve a vaccination rate um, of first 50%, then 75%, then 85% uh, as an organization. So, a little over a week ago, we hit 50%, and uh, right now we're right at about 54% and climbing. So hitting 50% means each employee received $100. And if we can get to 75%, then each employee would receive another 150. And if we get to 85%, which is an ambitious stretch goal, um, employees would get another $200. So we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, our numbers are tracking roughly in line with, uh, with the county's numbers. Um, and we have a lot of internal dialogue about this and, and how it's going. Uh, we are also moving ahead with our plans for returning to base. Assuming, again, this is a key assumption, if Governor Inslee transitions the economy of the state to phase four and lifts COVID restrictions, uh, by June 30th, as, as he has indicated his intent, uh, we will begin transitioning employees back to base uh, beginning July 6th after the holiday. We have developed a return to 
risk-based guidance document. Uh, we have shared that document with all employees. Uh, we've held one session with all of our managers and directors um, as a group uh, to walk through the approach. And uh, Cesar and his team and employee engagement have been meeting with individual management groups uh, and, and managers uh, to help them prepare for how they'll lead employees through this transition. Uh, my goal is by mid-June uh, to have our directors group and management cohort equipped to implement this program smoothly, um, to implement the transition in a way that employees will feel supported and that our agency business uh, is sustained without interruption. I think it's worth observing the decision to switch to remote work uh, happened very quickly. And it was in the face of an imminent threat that we didn't have a lot of information about. I think it's fair to, to, to predict that the transition back uh, will, be a, will be different um, because people have gotten used to working in a certain way. We've learned a lot uh, and it's not gonna be as quick to just bring everyone back. So we're going to ease into it. Um, we're going to support employees, make sure they've got the flexibility to, to transition uh, and maintain um, their lives outside work. We are also working as part of that on an updated telework policy. I think uh, for all employers and certainly for our administrative staff, one of the big takeaways from COVID is that it is possible to work productively remotely. Uh, so we're gonna be updating that policy and providing guidance uh, to directors and managers on, on how to administer that policy uh, and when be able to make those decisions about when it's appropriate to grant permission for folks to work uh, remotely uh, on a on a temporary basis or on a partial basis. Um, I've talked with a number of our, our peer organizations around the region and, and some employers here in Snohomish County and it, it, it seems well within the bounds of best practice um, to, to make that a part of our toolkit uh, for attracting and retaining talent and, and operating our business. The key for us is gonna be to have clarity about how that will work and what's expected of managers and employees when they're working within that kind of arrangement. Uh, in the process uh, of evaluating our COVID policies, uh, we are um, reviewing where we are with incident command, um, with premium pay, with travel, all those items that you would think of when you think of the before times. Uh, premium pay has been concluded as of the end of March. Um, I'm not authorizing any travel uh, through the third quarter. Um, we'll reevaluate that for the fourth quarter. Uh, WISTA has moved its conference, its annual conference to the fourth quarter. Um, the APTA annual conference is also scheduled for November. Uh, so we're gonna keep a close eye on how things are going with, with uh, best practice and, and and COVID response through the summer. And uh, we'll, we'll try to keep the door open for travel in the fourth quarter if that's appropriate. Um, on the operational front, of course, all this transition has implications for the service. Um, we need to stay adaptive uh, in our mindset as restrictions begin to lift. We've got multiple layers, and I'm sure you're all dealing with them in your jurisdictions, but at the local, state, and federal level. In particular, the mask mandate uh, at the federal level remains in place into September. Um, so that means for transit vehicles, uh, for transit facilities, uh, masks will still be required, uh, although we're told that's being evaluated all the time. Um, the mask mandate remains in effect in our office buildings and our shops uh, under LNI jurisdiction uh, and will remain so until LNI changes its guidance. So that could be June 30th or it could be later uh, if the governor makes a decision and then the agencies have to take action to implement that decision. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of interest in these in these topics because 
a lot of mixed signals out there. Um, physical distancing, I mentioned a little while ago, um, the state will have guidance on that. Uh, right now, we're still at six feet on board our coaches. Uh, and we're putting in place options to, uh, to shift uh, if necessary uh, and if the guidance changes. Um, ridership has been steady. Um, we're seeing it rise and drop uh, within a percent or two each week. Um, I'm seeing that in my own rides on the buses. I've seen some trips, particularly in the afternoons with a full swift coach as far as COVID, that means 15, 16, 17 people. Um, I came up this morning at about 8 a.m. and there were only a couple of people on the bus. So it's interesting, but the uh, coach operators are reporting increased traffic. And, um, you know, there, there are signs that things are beginning to uh, return to normal. So we are working all the time uh, trying to get clarification from the state. And that's why I dwelt on the WISTA conference going on right now a little earlier um, about what it's gonna mean and how it's gonna work for, um, for transit vehicles and social distancing on the vehicles um, if we transition to phase four. We have to sort of manage this closely because as we start to get people returning to the system, we start to run up against capacity constraints we have some strategies to deal with that. One is to add more coaches. Um, another is to change the physical distancing um, arrangements on board the vehicle to create more onboard capacity. So again, an adaptive mindset is necessary to help navigate this transition. A um, couple other items uh, real quickly and, and then I'll wrap up. Um, we've got, uh, I think some of you have probably heard this, but um, starting June 1, uh, ORCA card fees have been waived for youth riders. Uh, so it's no longer gonna cost uh, $5 to get an ORCA card for anybody if they're between the ages of six and 18. And kids younger than that don't need one. Uh, we've also been waiving fares uh, to and from any location uh, for customers who indicate verbally that they are uh, either going to or coming from a vaccination appointment. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of use on this, but um, there's anecdotally been some, and we're just trying to provide another incentive and another way for, for people to be able to uh, take advantage of the opportunities to get their vaccinations. Uh, so Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll move on to end there. Any Mr. agenda, Chair. the uh, community reports. Mr. Chair, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, uh, Rick, you'd mentioned in your report, and I just want to make sure I understood the LNI protocol for masking within your shop. Does that mean that if they're vaccinated, they do not have to wear a mask? If they have not been vaccinated, they do? As of right now, we're in phase three. And within the phase three um, protocol, we are all required to have masks while we're on base. Okay. Is that, so, specific, is that specific to a trans, to transit then? That's a good question. I, I don't know if Cesar's on the, on the call, but I can certainly follow up with him and, and find out if that's specifically for transit or, or if it's a more general requirement. Well, yeah, the, the only reason I ask, it's not a big deal. I mean, you, you, get, you know, uh, but I know like within cities, like at City Hall, we're required by LNI to get a signed form from those that are vaccinated. If we do get that, then people can be in the office, whether they're from the public or uh, employees without a mask. Um, if they have not been vaccinated and cannot attest to that, then they do have to wear a mask per LNI guidelines that we received about, a, I don't know, a week and a half or so ago. But I was just curious if it was different for transit. It's not, not a big deal. If, if I don't need the question answered here. But. So we're looking very closely right now at that very issue, uh, but in the context of bringing everybody yeah. back to the base yep. uh, and in a phase four context. Yeah, okay, thanks. And I, sadly, uh, Rick, I don't have an answer. I'm following up with uh, with uh, Jacob, who is our LNI contact and his team. But my understanding is that these guidelines are for transit. LNI has set out guidelines for different industries. 
but I'm getting confirmation from him. Okay, so we'll circle back with the board on that question. Thank, Thank you. you. Does anybody else have any questions for the CEO? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and move into committee reports. The executive committee met on Thursday, May 20th. Council member Schwitty, Mayor Nearing, and I attended and the CEO provided his report. <clears throat> the committee also received an update on the 2021 budget. Uh, and we discussed the transition plans for the monthly board meetings once the governor's phase four reopening plan takes effect, almost exactly what Rick has been telling us. Um, prepared to move from 100% remote board meetings to a hybrid model, which uh, Rachel and I believe Deb Osborne are testing right now. How's it going in there for that test there, Rachel? Pretty good. A couple, couple of things worked out, but, but pretty good, darn good. Okay. The plan is for the boardroom to be open in person attendees from the public. We will also maintain remote meeting participation and observation capabilities on the Zoom platform. There may be a limited capacity for in-person attendees, including board members and staff, dependent upon social distancing requirements. And the details of the hybrid meeting plan will be finalized in the coming weeks and then will be shared with the board and details will be shared on CT's website and the board meeting agenda. It will be up to each board committee to determine if they prefer to stay remote or be in person. So each of the other committees will be able to make that decision on their own, leaving that up to the chair of those committees. The next executive committee meeting is scheduled for June 17th at 1130. And that concludes the chair's or the uh, executive committee report. The next one would be the Finance, Performance, and Oversight Committee, Council Member Schwetti. Hey, good afternoon. <clears throat> the Finance, Performance, and Oversight Committee met on Thursday, May 20th, 2021, via Zoom. CEO Rick uh, Eldenfritz, agency staff, and board members Jared Mead, Tom Merrill, Sid Roberts, and I attended. Uh, the consent agenda, approval of April 2021 expenditures and payroll items C through G, action item resolution 04-21-2021 mid-year budget amendment. Uh, Jerry Beardsley and Mary Albert will present a PowerPoint outlining the mid-year budget amendments. The committee recommended approval of this resolution. Uh, reports the first quarter 2021 transit police report. Lieutenant David Bowman and Jacob uh, Pelter briefed the committee on this report. A copy is included in your board packet. I really, really encourage you guys to read that and read it slowly and carefully. Um, item two is uh, the sales tax report. Community transit collected approximately 12.4 million in sales tax approximately 4.2 million more than budgeted. This is for purchases made in February. Uh, the April diesel fuel report year to date, community transit paid an average of $1.92 per gallon for diesel fuel compared to the 2021 budgeted amount of $1.75 per gallon. The mid-year budget amendment, which is being presented at today's meeting includes an increase to the diesel fuel budget in response to higher than budgeted fuel rates and increased utilization. Uh, the next Finance Performance and Oversight Committee is scheduled for 2 p.m. Thursday, June 17, 2021 via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Schwede. Are there any questions for Council Member Schwede? Seeing none, we'll move on to the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee, Council Member Marine. Thank you, Chairman Daughtry. Uh, the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee meeting was held remotely over Zoom on Wednesday, May 26 at 2 p.m. It was attended by myself, Council Member Tom Merrill, Labor Representative Lance Norton, Mayor Nicholas Smith, and Council Member Stephanie Wright. The committee heard and forwarded two action items on today's agenda. The first is the ST Express Bus Operations and Maintenance Agreement and has been fully negotiated. The new agreement extends through December 31st of 2025 with options to continue through December 31st of 2028. Their current contract expires June 30th, 2021, uh, so very quickly. 
And staff are recommending approval of the agreement and we'll give a brief presentation on the partnership between Sound Transit and Community Transit. Uh, also, ITB 2021-011 MCOB maintenance improvements supports phase three of the facility master plan to expand and remodel the Merrill Creek operations base. The recommended contract award is with former construction for an amount not to exceed $19,265,427. The committee reviewed and forwarded one item for consent on today's agenda, and that is ITB 2021-007. It's to supply, install, operate, and maintain on-demand bike lockers. This item is for the supply, installation, maintenance, and operation of on-demand bike lockers at community transit park and rides and transit centers. The three-year contract with eLock Technologies is for $239,730. Uh, the committee heard one informational briefing on capital projects in the 2021 budget amendment. And the next meeting of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee is Wednesday, June the 16th at 2 p.m. Thank you, Councilmember Marine. Is there any uh, additional questions for Councilmember Marine? Excellent. Seeing, Thank you. Seeing none, we will move on. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion. I'll move approval. Second. Okay, I have a first and a second from John Nering and Joe Marine. Are there any discussions about the uh, on the motion? Seeing none, I'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Thank you. It's passed unanimously. Moving on, we have action items. Uh, Director Beardsley will introduce the first one. Thank you, appreciate uh, the introduction. Um, I'll just uh, take a few minutes. Rachel's gonna bring up the PowerPoint and I'll just do the first couple of slides and then turn it over to Mary Albert. Um, we, we are typically in front of the committee about this time of year with a mid-year amendment uh, for our budget. Um, you recall at our retreat recently at our workshop, we talked to you about all of the measures we'd taken to get through the pandemic uh, for safety, um, financially, et cetera. So Rachel, you can go to the next slide. Um, so just to kind of, I'm just gonna pull together what we talked about at the retreat, which is we, we did reduce costs. Um, we did assume a slow recovery with a reduced amount of sales tax revenue. Uh, we're well beyond the worst of the worst, I think. We have seen stronger than predicted re uh, sales tax revenue, also have seen uh, very generous amounts of federal recovery funds that we did not anticipate. All of that left us in a really good position to now be able to turn and pivot. Um, it's really a uh, couple of things you've already heard us talk about, initiatives, innovation, looking at new types of service, looking at um, uh, zero emission vehicles, et cetera. All of that is the stuff we want to turn and pivot to um, and start to build a budget and a transit development plan to allow us to accomplish some of those things. Next slide, Rachel. So where we're at right now is on the left side. Uh, this is the first of uh, probably at least two budget amendments. The, the first budget amendment of the year is typically about this time and we, we use it to do a number of things. We true up the revenue because as you know, when you adopted the budget, the year had not closed out. So we wanna make sure we capture the revenues that came in. So we've updated those um, to the positive, happy to say. Um, we also try to capture un unplanned expenses and new capital projects. And you'll see that we have very few unplanned expenses and they're really COVID related for the most part. Um, we have a number of new capital projects and the, um, the board has heard about those and Mary will talk about the funding amounts for those. And then we're just starting to restore the reserves. We'll have more of that when we come back with the 2022 budget. What you'll see next is next month, the draft of the transit development plan, which is our six year horizon, including uh, this year and next year. And then we use that to really help shape the 2022 budget, which will come to you later in the uh, beginning of the fall uh, for you to look at. Um, so really the, uh, we consider the mid-year budget amendment pretty technical in nature. The size is larger than we have seen in the past, obviously, but the, the process is the same and the, the reasons for the amendment are the same. 
So I'm going to uh, turn to Mary Albert now so that she can walk through the specifics of the amendment. Next slide. Thank you, Jerry. This slide before you shows uh, a snapshot of our 2020 actuals compared with our very uh, conservatively developed uh, 2021 budget, as well as what the budget will look like once the proposed amendment um, is uh, entered in. And essentially, um, we have more operating revenues than we had anticipated. Jerry had mentioned that, but specifically, we're looking at more sales tax than expected, as well as the CRISA stimulus funds that we did not know about when the 2021 budget was developed. There's also um, a greater focus on our capital program this year, which is why we have an increase in that blue bar on the right in each section. Uh, we've also focused on holding the line on our operating expenditures and are only asking for a modest adjustment in the budget amendment. Next slide, please. The first section of the amendment adjusts both our beginning cash balances as well as several revenue items. So when we projected cash in the 2021 proposed budget, we didn't know about what our sales tax was going to look like and also didn't realize that we would bill all of the CARES Act revenue. So we ended up with about 45 million more in terms of our overall cash than we had expected at the time the budget was adopted. So this amendment brings our cash balance up to uh, actuals. We're also requesting increases in two other budget line items, the 2021 sales tax revenue, we're chewing that up with what's been received through April, as well as requesting an increase in the grant revenues in our operating budget for the CRISA funds. You can also expect another adjustment request for our revenue budgets later on in the year. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of our operating expenditure requests, really we're just looking at some additional requests that we did not anticipate when the budget was developed the premium pays, additional leave, and also the ability to um, provide the capacity we need in terms of coach operators. That's the first request. That second $2 million is for an increase to contracted services, and that's to be able to pay for the contractor premium pays, as well as those service recovery operator coaches. And then the final request is for an increase to our fuel budget. Um, once again, our fuel prices are back to where they were a couple years ago. Next slide. The other big focus of this amendment is on our capital program. Last year, we had intended to start an LED upgrade project for our park and ride locations, but that got sidetracked a bit with the pandemic. So we're, we're requesting that we start that project again. The next two requests are facilities master plan projects, the land for vehicle storage, as well as the ride store remodel. And then we are also requesting funding for a rather large upgrade to both our HR and our financial systems. And then we also have a series of new innovation projects. We're going to kick off the zero emissions vehicles project with a study to review the scope. And this may turn into a reserve and a future project. We also have a more modest but very impactful project for on-demand bike lockers. This is a three-year project that will really open up capacity for our bike riders to store their bikes. And then the final request is for air purification systems for our revenue vehicles. 
Next slide. And then finally, we are making some adjustments to our reserve balances. Some of these you won't see called out in the amendment specifically. These you will see in the first quarter financial report. The fuel reserve is being restored to $5 million. We are also expanding our operating reserve to be four months of operating expenditures instead of two months. And then we have some miscellaneous adjustments to the ending balances in several capital projects funds. And then the last item that's very noteworthy is that our ending cash in the general fund that is available for sustainability and for expansion is increasing by about 24 and a half million. And once again, we will be bringing another amendment to you later on in the year. I should say at least one more amendment and you may expect some adjustments in the 2022 budget, especially in light of stimulus from the American Rescue Program. Any questions? Thank you, Mary and Sherry. That was insightful. I was going to ask a question, but it wouldn't be fair because you wouldn't have time to answer it. So I'll ask you <laughs> offline. It's just something that I'm interested in, but it has no uh, bearing on what we're doing today. Does anybody have any questions? Seeing this is an action item, I would take a motion. Uh, Chair, I would propose that the board of directors, or I would move that the board of directors approve the proposed amendments to the 2021 budget as presented in resolution number 0421. Second. Uh, second. Oh. <laughs> I okay, so it has been moved by uh, <clears throat> council member Joe Marine, seconded by Mayor John, John Nearing. Are is there any discussions on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstains? Or should I say abstentions? Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda is another action item. And Director Behe will introduce it. Thank you. Yeah, we're, um, we're really excited to be moving forward today with the next phase of our facility master plan. The board has been uh, briefed on this overall program at every step of the way. Uh, today's action really marks a major milestone in awarding the second construction contract of the program. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge this as a really significant step um, on the path the agency is taking to providing operational and maintenance capacity that will support growth for really decades to come. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute to thank the capital development team that has been focused on delivering this program, as well as the procurement team that supports them. And Greg Stamaccio, our um, capital development program manager, will provide more information about the action item. Greg? Yeah, thank you, Roland. Um, as Roland mentioned, we're very excited to be here today presenting this uh, construction project um, and getting started on the second construction project within our program. The Facilities Master Plan 3A expansion is an expansion and renovation of the Merrill Creek Operation Building and will provide additional capacity and flexibility at that location. A reminder, in the March board meeting, um, we came and presented two specific contracts that were support contracts for this specific project, the Facilities Master Plan 3A, a hoist purchase contract, um, and a construction management consultant contract to assist our team in managing this contract. And at that point, we were in the 90% design and uh, mentioned that we'd be back this summer with a construction contract, and that's what we are here for today. Uh, the Facilities Master Plan 3A, will allow for double tolls to be maintained at this base, better storage and optimized working layouts. Next slide, please, Rachel. Thank you. 
As a quick reminder, um, the area in yellow is the addition, which is approximately 19,000 square feet, which will have uh, six new maintenance bays. After the addition is completed, um, we will, at that point, begin renovations of the old shops and provide uh, better storage, um, new bathrooms, um, better um, and optimized working layouts for our mechanics. Next slide, Rachel. So we uh, received three, or I'm sorry, four bids from all from Northwest companies on uh, May the 12th. The low responsive bidder, uh, former construction um, at just over 19.2 million, being within 1.4% of our independent government cost estimate. And we feel very fortunate um, that we received the bid pretty close to where we were expecting due to the volatility in the construction markets. You may have seen recently in the Seattle Times and other publications, and I'm sure you're seeing this with your own jurisdictions as well. Um, the volatility in construction, namely in labor, steel and lumber um, has put a quite a constraint on construction bidding. So since we are so close um, to our independent estimates, we find this bid to be fair and reasonable. A key item to point out is that um, this number, it was budgeted for in the 2021 budget and is planned and included in the 2021 funds. And that is the end of the presentation. So uh, the last slide is just the recommendation and I will be here for any questions that the board may have. Does the board have any questions? Just, just one quick one. Go ahead, John. Yes, sir. The, the low bid appears to be almost 4 million lower than anybody else. Was there any, just with the uh, materials, rise in materials costs, was there any concern there that, or are we we're confident that that's, that's a solid bid anyway? Yes, we've had that discussion with, with the contractor, um, and we, we had a similar question at, at committee. Um, the costs are uh, of that base contract are locked for the duration of the contract. Of course, okay. any change orders are, are negotiated at, at fair market rates during that time, um, but we have had this discussion with, with our contractor, and, and they are confident within their, their numbers. That's awesome. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, uh, this is Joe. I will move that the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer to execute a contract with former construction company for a not to exceed amount of $19,265,427. Thank you. Second. And uh, Mr. Roberts has a second. Is there any uh, conversation around the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Passed unanimously. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. Next, we'll move on to the third action item and Director B, he will also start this one out for us. Thank Director you, Chair. B. Um, so as the board is aware, one of our most important partner agency relationships is with Sound Transit. Uh, and specifically around our provision of Sound Transit's ST Express commuter bus service. The agencies are connected on a daily basis regarding um, every aspect of providing this service. So operational uh, coordination, planning, customer service, technology, um, really every aspect of that. All of that work is done under the guidance and framework of an interagency agreement. And we typically renew that on a five-year cycle. The teams from both agencies have been underway with work on this for more than a year. And Wade Mahala is our manager of contracted services. I wanna thank Wade, June Duvall, Matt Coombs and their team for the work on this agreement. And Wade is gonna provide more background uh, and um, information on the action that is before the board today. So Wade. Thank you, Roland. Um, Good afternoon, uh, Chair Dantre and board members. Um, I'm pleased uh, to be here today to present to you this information surrounding our partnership agreement with Santa Francisco regarding the SD Express service that we operate. Um, Rachel, next slide. This relationship goes back to 1999 when we first began providing the SD Express services 
Uh, Community Transit has subcontracted the operations and maintenance work of this XD Express out to First Transit, who operates out of our Cash Park operating base. This new partnership agreement will be from 2021 through 2025 with three one-year extensions available. With negotiations, legal review, and committee review completed, we are now bringing it to you, the board. Next, please. In this slide, we depict the relationships between all the parties. Sound Transit contracts with their SD Express with Community Transit, and in turn, we subcontract that service out to First Transit. Sound Transit does not have a relationship with First Transit, but only with Community Transit, who through the O&M agreement can direct work to First Transit. In this partnership, CT provides the facility and operations and maintenance as well as fuel technology systems, along with many other support functions, some of which are like security, data reporting, and scheduling. Our subcontractor, First Transit, provides the bus operations and all the bus maintenance. Next, please. These charts depict uh, and provide context for the scale of the contracted bus operations relative to all the bus services, as well as the split between the CT and the ST service within our commuter bus contract. Vehicle hours for ST service is currently at 21% uh, of the contracted services, and their fleet size depicts 16% of the coaches here at the Cash Park base. Next. This contract is cost neutral for community transit. The cost allocation model identifies an appropriate share of CT agency expenses that supports provisions of the SD Express service. The cost, the cost model has been audited, reviewed by both agencies and deemed reasonable. The overall cost estimate of 18.8 .8 million for the first year is comprised of three components. Uh, 15.6 million in purchase transportation and diesel fuel expenses that is billed monthly based on actual consumptions. 0.3 million is in fixed costs such as facility expenses and that's negotiated for the term of the agreement. And finally, there's 2.6 million in support costs provided directly by community transit such as security, scheduling, overhead, contract oversight, et cetera. And these costs are estimated and then reconciled annually based on final expenses. Next. <clears throat> Timeline. Back in January of last year, we started our negotiations as planned. And then in March of 2020, we had to pivot quickly <laughs> on many fronts due to the pandemic. Both agencies agreed to extend through June of 2021 to allow more time due to additional workloads. Early this month, we completed those negotiations. And as you can see on the slide, we are quickly moving through our processes. May 6, ST took this to their committee. May 26, we presented to our SADC. May 27th, ST presented to their board. And then today we are before you, our board. Next. With the negotiations completed, this partnership agreement will be, as we said earlier, a five-year agreement and through 2025 with three option years through 2028. This agreement is structured to give both CT and SD flexibility to reshape our role in the SD Express as we learn how commuters adjust to Linwood Link and as both agencies make changes to our future services. This is reflected in both our 2021 budget and our 2020 through 2025 TDP. Next. I'd be happy to answer any questions. The next slide will be our uh, recommendation. Is there any questions? Yeah, Kim, I have a question. Okay. Uh, just a point of clarification. Uh, the 64 buses, are those owned by Community Transit or Sound Transit? There's actually, give me a second here. 64 Sound Transit buses, and they are owned by Sound Transit, and most of them are double-deckers. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Wade? All right, could we go to the next slide? Thank you very much, Rachel. I would entertain a motion. Second. 
seeing none, we'll move on. <laughs> uh, well, I'll make the motion. I'll make the motion. Board Member there. Smith. <laughs> oh, okay, go ahead. Is that okay? Yep. Uh, so I move that the Board of Directors, oh, I have to move your faces off of here. I move that the Board of Directors authorize the Chief Executive Officer to execute the interagency agreement between Community Transit and Sound Transit for ST Express bus service operation <clears throat> and maintenance. Thank, Thank you. you, Mayor Smith. Do I have a second? Second. And Councilmember Merrill, thank you for your second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, the next thing we're going to go into is the chair's report. I don't really have too much. Uh, we've had some beautiful days recently. Yesterday, Lake Stevens opened up their first farmer's market for the season. It was very well attended, uh, probably too well attended. Uh, but every the park was just jam packed. Um, the, the, I guess if you just kind of looked at it, the mask to no mask ratio was about 50%, maybe 60% no mask and a little bit less of that in, uh, in mass. Uh, so everybody was kind of concerned about that, but it went pretty good, pretty well. People seemed to be cognizant of how close they were to each other. Um, but other than that, but it was really well attended, really uh, did well. The, the weather was beautiful, as you all know about the same as it is today. We didn't have much of a breeze yesterday. Um, so that kind of, I don't know if all of you are experiencing those kinds of things in your jurisdictions yet, but we certainly are here in Lake Stephen. I think people are just ready to get out and do something. So that was uh, interesting. We also had uh, over the weekend, Memorial Day weekend, we had a cruise of cars go around. Over 200 vehicles went around the lake about eight times and uh, took several hours and uh, that was well attended also all along the, the perimeter of that we call it the covid cruise and it was the um it was the second annual covid cruise i don't think hopefully there'll not be a third annual covid cruise hopefully they'll change the name so that is that uh is my report i'll open this up to board communications and we'll start with uh council member merrill um i don't have anything to offer today thank you thank you tom Council member Joe Marine. Uh, I do not have anything to report other than, uh, yeah, nice weather. So people enjoy it. Great, thank you. And actually one more thing I did, I do remember, I did want to say also to a, a big thank you to Mayor Smith for representing us well at Sound Transit. And, um, and so I'm sure she will be missed there. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> and Mayor Smith. Um, thank you, Joe. Uh, yeah, I was going to say it's kind of fun seeing these uh, contracts go back and forth between community transit and sound transit because I've been at sound transit for six hours today. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, the, again, I'll say, because I think I said it last time, that the collaboration, the spirit of collaboration uh, and working together between the two agencies is uh, really great and it's uh, expressed on both sides of how nice it is to work with each other. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Smith. Uh, Council Member Schwede. Uh, I don't have much, just uh, they have started putting up the frames on the Amazon building. So if anyone would like to just be wowed, <laughs> you're welcome to drive down 172nd. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Schwede. Council Member Roberts. No comments today. It's all good in Stanwood. Thank you. Mayor Nearing. Yeah, no comments here either. Thank you very much. And who am I missing? Uh, Labor Representative Norton. I have nothing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Am I missing anybody? Oh, how about uh, Council Member Mead? Uh, no report, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Reed. I think I got everybody. All right, good. Um, next, uh, we're gonna go into executive se session. There is no action expected following this executive session. It should take about 15 minutes in duration from the start. 
board members and alternates, if they wish, may now depart this Zoom meeting. Don't do it yet. And join the executive session Zoom meeting, which is uh, a separate meeting. And it was given to you on your agenda at the top of the page. So you have a link at the top of the page of the agenda. Once we are back, we will continue with our meeting uh, to uh, close it out with other business and adjournment. As I said before, there is no action expected to follow. And this is for the consideration of acquisition of real estate and potential litigation. Do you have any questions? Everybody have the link, ready to go, ready, set, go.
Executive session has been extended 10 minutes.
Labor Representative Norton is back. Mr. Chair? Thank you, Lance. I got you. I was muted. Sorry. Okay, that, was my, that was my fault. Looks like we've got Kim. everybody back on the board. Uh, I don't know if we're missing any staff or not. Uh, I guess not back yet. I think we see everybody back, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on then. Uh, is there any other business to be brought before the board? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. Move to adjourn. It's been moved. Second. And seconded. I believe that was uh, Mayor Nering. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I don't think we've ever opposed adjourning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. You I guys. appreciate your attention to the details, asking good questions, and uh, doing good for community transit. Thank yeah. you very see, much. See you guys. Thanks, everybody.